In this video, we're going to talk about capnography. Capnography. Or the measurement of expired carbon dioxide. It's something that's becoming very prevalent in clinical practice, so I thought it's worth doing a video on it to summarize some of the key points. So let's begin with some of the sort of basic principles. All metabolically active tissues, those that undergo aerobic metabolism, will consume oxygen and they will produce carbon dioxide. <clears throat> that carbon dioxide is returned to the heart by the venous blood, and the heart, specifically the right ventricle, will pump the blood to the lungs, where alveolar ventilation will take place, and carbon dioxide will be excreted and exhaled. So, knowing this, we can measure exhaled carbon dioxide and utilize that information clinically. So let's talk about just some definitions that you'll hear and some of the terms and some of the things you'll see clinically. So let's start off with capnometry. So capnometry with this metry ending is simply just a, the measurement and then numerical display of the concentration of carbon dioxide. So that's like having a, a monitor attached to the, someone's endotracheal tube and it's simply giving you a number of what the um, entitled CO2 is. Capnography with the graphy ending um, is um, more display of a graphical representation of carbon dioxide versus time. So this is something where you're actually going to see a waveform. And then one of the other things that you'll see is um, colorimetric capnography, or sometimes called colorimetric CO2 detectors. And these are commonly used in, uh, in ICU and in critical care and in the emergency room just to simply detect a sort of yes or no, is CO2 present? And those look like this. Some of you may have seen those. So they have a pH sensitive filter here that will change from purple uh, to yellow when it, when it detects carbon dioxide. And I took this picture from the uh, New England Journal of Medicine article that I've, I've referenced in the, um, in the comments there that a lot of this video is based off of. So those are sort of some of the terms, capnometry, capnography, and then sort of colorimetric CO2 detection. Okay, so just not super important, but nice to have the kind of terminology under our belt. So let's look then at some of the indications for, for capnometry and capnography. So some of the things you may have seen before is confirming endotracheal tube placement. So obviously the lungs produce carbon dioxide in a fairly continuous fashion and the esophagus and the stomach doesn't. So the presence of continuous waveforms of um, CO2 is a very good indicator that you've placed a breathing tube in the trachea and not in the esophagus. We also use... Um, uh, cap, uh, capnography for monitoring mechanical ventilation, both in the ICU setting and in the anesthesia setting. So this is very common in the anesthesia world and the critical care world. But more so in the recent years, we've seen a movement towards the utilization of um, capnography to monitor spontaneous ventilation. And this is cropping up in a variety of different locations. Again, in the ICU, um, the post-anesthesia care unit is very common, very common now in the emergency department um, and some of the emergency practitioners are becoming very familiar in, um, with the use of cap, um, capnography in resuscitation, in procedural sedation and in a variety of other settings. And it also crops up in places like the sleep lab, anytime you really want to measure someone's ventilation who's spontaneously breathing. Um, recent guidelines have also started to include a continuous capnography in uh, resuscitation guidelines. So we can use this as you look at our flow diagram here. The better you're performing CPR, the more you're pumping blood to the lungs to be ventilated and therefore the more end tidal CO2 will be detected on your monitor. So we're actually starting to use capnography as a sort of surrogate to determine whether our um, chest compressions and cardiopulmonary resuscitation is effective or not. So there's really lots of indications and lots of uses for capnography nowadays, and it's really just growing. What are the contraindications? The good thing is there's really no contraindications to, to capnography. The only sort of caveat to that is that you really have to interpret the results you're getting within the clinical context of the patient's disease and what the, what the circumstances are. So now that we've talked about some of the indications, contraindications, how does it work? How do we actually measure 
CO2 and expire breath. So I'm not a physics major by any means, but here's the basic principle of it. It's something called infrared absorption spectroscopy, which is a long-winded phrase, but it is essentially an infrared light emitter will pass a certain wavelength of light, which happens to be this 4.3 microns, um, and that gets picked up by an infrared light detector. Now CO2 will absorb this wavelength of light. So the more CO2 is passing through your detector, the less of this light that is emitted is going to get picked up by your detector. So if you know how much light you're emitting and you know how much you're detecting, you can therefore deduce how much CO2 is absorbing whatever the difference is. That's the basic principle. And this is the kind of most common way that CO2 detectors are working nowadays. Now there's a couple of ways that these can be um, applied to the patient. And um, I'll use the example of an intubated patient here. So this is something that I drew quickly earlier. And you'll see that there is the main two ways that we utilize this um, absorption spectroscopy is either through mainstream analyzing or inline, and then this side stream analyzing. So in the mainstream analyzer, you have this uh, CO2 detector, which would just be one of these really, uh, on a cuvette attached to the endotracheal tube here. As the patient expires gas, the light is passed through it, and then that signal is taken back to your monitor to, um, to determine your capnography and give you your capnogram, which, as it says on the monitor here, will include your entitled CO2, but should also give you a full waveform. In side stream monitoring, it's slightly different. Instead of having something directly attached to the patient's breathing circuit or endotracheal tube, you can see here that there's a, a, a capillary tube that is um, sampling gas from the Y piece of this mechanical ventilator circuit or the anesthesia circuit or whatever this may be. And it has to actually siphon off and aspirate gas from this tube. And then it is measured in a similar way uh, back at the monitor. So that's what we call side stream monitoring. So these are the kind of two most common ways that these are used. Um, and there's kind of an important difference between the two when you, um, when you look at uh, waveforms there. So let's pull up some waveforms. You'll see here that this increase in airway pressure here, let's say this fellow is being mechanically ventilated. So rising airway pressure would be inspiration. Um, and you'll see that during inspiration, because the, the content of carbon dioxide content in inspired gas is extraordinarily low, there's no CO2 detected on the monitor during inspiration. When inspiration cycles to expiration here, you see the sharp line down there, and you see the sharp rise in expiratory flow, that signals that we've moved into expiration. When expiration begins, that's when we're going to start detecting CO2, right? Because that's where the concentrated carbon dioxide is in our expired gas. Um, the mainstream monitor you'll see that's right in line with the circuit will pretty much immediately detect that um, expired gas, that expired CO2. But what you'll notice is that the side stream monitoring here um, looks a little bit different. You'll see at first that this is sloping upwards a little bit more. And that's because the, the if you think about this initial portion of gas that's aspirated through the a capillary tube here, is gonna reflect the patient's anatomic dead space, which won't necessarily have huge amounts of CO2 in it because it's gonna be filled with um, gas that came in on the last inspiration. But as the alveoli start to empty, you'll see a rapid rise in the carbon dioxide level, which will then plateau and reach a peak at the end tidal. So this would be end tidal would be at this corner here. If we just drew a little cross there, that would be your end tidal level. Okay. But you notice that it's a little bit, oops, uh, you notice that it's a little bit kind of off from when the mainstream was. And we call this kind of out of phase and in phase. So this is because there's a delay in that the gas has to actually be aspirated through the tube to be measured on the monitor. So with side stream monitoring, you'll see a delay um, in the it's a very short delay, but you'll see a delay in the in the waveform on the screen, whereas in mainstream you won't. So hopefully this video has given you a little bit of an introduction into capnography. In the coming videos, we'll get more into detail into some of these things. We'll get into some of these waveforms. We'll talk about uh, time-based capnography and volume-based capnography, and we'll really sort of stick our teeth into it. But this hopefully gives a good overview for anyone who's just got a few minutes to, to freshen up on this stuff. So I'll see you in the next videos.